Good morning, and welcome to Ionis Pharmaceuticals' fourth quarter and full year 2020 financial results conference call. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Wade Walk, Vice President of Investor Relations, to lead off the call. Please begin. Thank you, Tom. Before we begin, I encourage everyone to go to the investor section of the Ionis website to find the press release and related financial tables including a reconciliation of the GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures that we will discuss today. We believe non-GAAP financial results better represent the economics of our business and how we manage our business. We also have posted slides on our website that accompany our discussion today. With me on today's call are Brett Monia, Chief Executive Officer, Beth Haugen, Chief Financial Officer, and Richard Geary, Executive Vice President of Development. And joining us for Q&A are Oneza Cattare, Chief Corporate Development and Commercial Officer, and Eric Swayze, Executive Vice President of Research. I would like to draw your attention to slide three, which contains our forward-looking language statement. We will be making forward-looking statements, which are based on our current expectations and beliefs. These statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties, and our actual results may uh, differ materially. I encourage you to consult the risk factors discussed in our SEC filings for additional details. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Brett. Thanks, Wade. Good morning, and thank you for joining us on today's call. Last year marked a new beginning for IONIS. With new leadership in place, we laid out a bold new vision for the business and took important steps towards realizing our goal of having 12 or more medicines on the market in 2026. Key to our new vision is our strategy to maximize the value of each medicine in our wholly owned portfolio. Today, our focus is primarily on commercializing our rare neurological and cardiometabolic disease medicines. For those opportunities outside these core areas, we will set a course forward that maximizes the value of each medicine, which may include IONIS commercialization or partnering. Last year, we accelerated our commercial strategy by acquiring Axia. This transaction also enabled us to strengthen our organization and to recognize the full value from Axia's rich product portfolio. Further, our distribution agreement with Sobe made it possible for us to restructure our European operations, which further streamlined our business. We were able to unlock substantial resources through these transactions, which we are investing in the business in the following three key areas. First, we're advancing and expanding our wholly owned pipeline. Second, we're building our commercial capabilities in support of our rich pipeline as we prepare to launch prioritized medicines from the IONIS wholly owned pipeline. And third, we're broadening the reach of our technology through investments in medicinal chemistry, human genomics, validation of new routes of delivery and through other means. We believe investing in these three key areas provides the greatest potential to drive future growth and to achieve our goal of 12 or more medicines on the market in 2026. Last year, we made substantial progress towards achieving this goal with numerous significant advances across our rich late and mid-stage pipeline. We now have six phase three studies underway, including three studies with whole new medicines. We also have a prolific mid-stage pipeline of medicines advancing towards phase three development many of which are expected to reach pivotal trials in the near term. With so many programs in mid to later stages of development, together with our historically high rate of clinical success, today we are in the enviable position of delivering a steady cadence of phase three data readouts for many years to come. And we're especially excited about the upcoming phase three readout of the Valor study for Tofersen in patients with SOD1 ALS, with data expected in the second half of this year. Positive results from this study would put us one step closer to providing the first ever disease-modifying therapy for ALS. And importantly, positive Tofersen results would also provide for the first time tangible clinical evidence that treatment is possible for patients with ALS, providing hope for all patients suffering from this devastating disease. And more broadly, Tofersen's success would once again demonstrate the power of our antisense technology to pioneer new markets and deliver transformational medicines to patients. In addition to advancing our pipeline, 
We're also expanding the utility of our technology, having now demonstrated proof of concept for aerosol delivery of antisense medicines to the lung. Based on these results, we're well on our way in building a new pulmonary disease franchise with the potential to treat conditions such as cystic fibrosis, COPD, IPF, and asthma. We've only scratched the surface of the unique capabilities of our antisense platform. With the medicines advancing in our pipeline today, we have the potential to continuously pioneer new markets in areas of significant unmet medical need and change the standards of care for diseases needing better treatment options for many years to come. As we, begin, as we began the year in 2020, we of course could not have imagined the challenges society would face from the global COVID-19 pandemic. Because of the dedication of our employees and strength of our technology and our business, we were able to successfully manage the evolving pandemic and achieve our key goals for 2020. This includes achieving our 2020 financial guidance while advancing our pipeline and our technology. As Beth will describe in more detail, we plan to put our substantial financial resources to work even more this year by increasing our investments in our medicines and our technology. We believe this has the greatest potential to drive future revenue and earnings growth. And with that, I'd like to turn the call over to Beth to review our 2020 financial results and our 2021 financial guidance, which is focused on maximizing the value of our wholly owned pipeline. Then Richard will discuss our key recent pipeline achievements and highlight important areas of focus for this year. After Richard, I'll wrap up our prepared remarks before taking your questions. Now over to Beth. Thank you, Brett. I'm pleased to say that we exceeded our 2020 guidance with revenues in excess of $700 million and net income of $111 million on a non-GAAP basis. We achieved these results while continuing to invest heavily in our rich pipeline with a focus on our wholly owned medicine. And we're particularly pleased with these results given the challenging global pandemic environment. In the fourth quarter of 2020, we took important steps toward our goal of creating a stronger, more efficient company when we acquired Axia and moved our European operations to a distribution model. Together, these transactions unlocked substantial cost savings that we plan to reinvest to drive future revenue growth. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes, but first I'll walk through our 2020 financial highlights beginning with revenue. Last year, about 50% of our total revenue came from our marketed products, with the majority coming from Spinraza. Most of the remaining 50% of our revenue came from eight different partners as together we advanced more than 20 programs. Our ability to generate revenue from numerous diverse sources is a key element of our financial strength. Spinraza continued its blockbuster performance last year generating over $2 billion in global sales. We earned $286 million in royalty revenue as a result, and virtually all of that revenue falls to our bottom line as profit. Iogen remains committed to enhancing patient outcomes and reinforcing the proven efficacy and safety profile of Spinraza in SMA patients of all ages. The RESPOND study and the DEVOTE study are two examples of this commitment. The RESPOND study, which is now underway, is evaluating Spinraza's potential benefit in SMA patients who have experienced a suboptimal response to gene therapy. And the DEVOTE study, which is evaluating the potential to deliver even greater benefits with higher doses of Spinraza compared to the currently approved dose, is now enrolling patients in the pivotal blinded cohort. Given Spinraza's robust efficacy and safety profile established in SMA patients of all ages, Spinraza continues to be a foundation of care for the treatment of these patients. And with over 11,000 patients on treatment at the end of last year and over 60,000 SMA patients in market where Biogen has a commercial presence we believe Spinraza's future remains bright. Texeti and Weilibra had combined product sales of $70 million, an increase of more than 65% compared to 2019, as these medicines launched into new markets and new patients began treatment in existing markets. 
TechSETI has demonstrated consistent quarterly growth since launch, driven by new patient growth in established markets, such as the U.S., and a new market across Europe. Last year, we achieved pricing and reimbursement in numerous new countries, bringing the markets in which TechSETI is commercially available to 15. Notably, we began generating revenue in countries across Southern Europe, including Portugal, which is strategically important because of its large endemic HATTR patient population. We began recognizing revenue in Canada, and we continue to expand into Latin America. Patients in Brazil and Argentina are being treated with TechSETI under a named patient program administered by our partner, PPC. In its first full year of commercial sales, Waylivra achieved important successes despite the pandemic. Through the efforts of our European team, we achieved pricing and reimbursement in six major European markets. Waylivra is under review for marketing authorization in Brazil through PTC, and we are optimistic about a potential approval this year. PTC is continuing continuing its efforts to expand access in other Latin American markets as well. During 2020, we earned R&D revenues of approximately $365 million, slightly above our annual average of $350 million. Approximately 80% of our R&D revenue is from medicines in our leading cardiometabolic and neurology franchises, with more than $165 million from our cardiometabolic franchise and over $125 million from our neurology franchise. Additionally, we earned nearly $50 million from Al Nylon last year. This included $41 million in sub-license fee revenue we earned in the fourth quarter when we obtained a favorable award in our arbitration proceeding. As 2020 once again demonstrated, our ability to consistently earn revenue from multiple sources is a key pillar of our financial strength. As we projected in our 2020 guidance, our non-GAAP operating expenses increased compared to 2019. The increase was driven by growth of just over 10% in non-GAAP R&D expenses related to advancing our phase three programs for TTR LICA and APOC3 LICA, plus our wholly owned medicine. Our SG&A expenses on a non-GAAP basis were slightly lower year over year primarily from reduced travel and related expenses due to the pandemic. We exceeded our net income guidance of meaningfully profitable with net income of $111 million on a non-GAAP basis. And we ended 2020 with nearly $2 billion in cash, enabling us to increase our investments across our business. As a result of our Axia and Sobe transactions, we recognized approximately $400 million of related expenses in Q4 last year. Importantly, most of these expenses were non-cash and non-recurring. We excluded these expenses from the non-GAAP results I just reviewed with you because they do not reflect our normal ongoing operations. These expenses were comprised of 31 million of severance and retention costs, 59 million of non-cash stock-based compensation expense, and $312 million in a non-cash adjustment of our valuation allowance for our federal deferred tax assets. I'd like to just take a couple minutes to provide some additional information about the adjustment to our valuation allowance. Since Axia's IPO, we've been required to report our federal taxes as two separate companies. That meant that Axia's operating losses and R&D tax credits were not available to reduce IONIS's taxable income during that time. As a result of the acquisition, we were able to reconsolidate the two companies for federal tax purposes, and we'll now combine Axia's expected losses with IONIS's taxable income, resulting in tax losses for the next few years as we make significant investments to drive future revenue growth from our rich pipeline. Additionally, this means Axia's pre-acquisition federal tax assets of nearly $300 million are now available to us to reduce our consolidated taxable income in the future. However, because we anticipate consolidated tax losses in the near term, 
we are required to establish a valuation allowance against these deferred tax assets. So while it's a large number, it's important to note that this is a non-cash adjustment based on technical accounting guidance and reflects the substantial tax benefits we have available to us to reduce our consolidated taxable income in the future. Now I'd like to provide some color on the financial benefits from our AXIA acquisition and the restructuring of our European operations. Last year, we put our strong balance sheet to work when we reacquired AXIA. The acquisition provided us with significant financial benefits. First, we retained the full value of AXIA's rich portfolio, which we expect to drive considerable revenue growth in the future. Second, we are realizing significant cost savings from the efficiencies we are achieving by operating as a single company. Third, we gained full access to Exia's substantial cash balance of nearly $400 million at the time of the acquisition, enabling us to freely use it to maximize the value of our medicine. And fourth, we gained access to the nearly $300 million of Exia's deferred tax assets I discussed a few moments ago. We are also realizing significant financial benefits from our SOBI transaction. Restructuring our European operations improves our bottom line by enabling us to distribute Texedi and Waylibra in a more cost-effective manner by leveraging SOBI's commercial infrastructure and reach across Europe. As a result, we expect to realize substantial savings. In aggregate, we expect to realize more than $50 million of savings in 2021. And we are putting these substantial savings to work by reinvesting them in other value driving areas of our business. Now turning to our 2021 financial guidance. We are projecting to earn more than $600 million in revenue, incur operating expenses in the range of $675 million to $725 million, and end 2021 with a net loss of less than $75 million, assuming the low end of expenses, all on a non-GAAP basis. Our 2021 guidance reflects our new strategy to maximize the value of our wholly owned medicine, focused primarily on commercializing our rare neurological and cardiometabolic disease programs. Our guidance also reflects the shift in revenue for Tixetti and Waylibra in Europe from product revenue to royalty revenue. As I mentioned a few moments ago, our restructured European operations will provide us with substantial savings, which we are redeploying to achieve our growth objectives. As we've always done, our R&D revenue is probabilized based primarily on the anticipated timing of the many different milestone payments we anticipate achieving as we advance partnered programs. Because of this approach, we have upside opportunity, particularly since we expect our R&D revenues to be higher in the second half of this, the year compared to the first half. We expect our operating expenses to increase as we invest in driving future growth. <clears throat> that means investing our resources in three key areas, advancing and expanding our wholly owned pipeline, building our commercial capabilities, and broadening the reach of our technology. Our investments in our pipeline are focused on advancing our ongoing phase three studies for TTR LICA and APOC3 LICA, starting a new phase three study for APOC3 LICA in a larger patient population, advancing ION363 in patients with FUS ALS into phase three development, and continuing to progress our multiple mid-stage programs. We are also investing in building our commercial capabilities. With Axia, we acquired a strong commercial foundation and we continue to build on that foundation. Specifically, we have established a new product strategy, strategy team, which is focused on go-to-market strategies and indication optimization ahead of launching our wholly owned benefit. And we are investing to broaden the reach of our technology ensuring our platform remains innovative and competitive. 
We expect our R&D expenses to increase approximately 25 to 35% in 2021 compared to last year. And because most of our synergies are within SG&A, we expect our SG&A expenses to decrease. We can increase our investments as I just described while projecting a modest net loss this year because of our multiple sources of revenue and the significant cost savings we realized from acquiring Exia and restructuring our European operations. Our capital allocation strategy is focused on investing internally for growth. We strongly believe this is the best use of our capital. We are confident that investing in our medicines can grow future revenues at double digit rates as we bring more and more new medicines to the market and achieve our goal of 12 or more marketed products in 2026. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Richard. Thank you, Beth. We made important progress across our portfolio in 2020, including moving many of our wholly owned programs closer to market. We're pleased with the performance of our phase three assets with several key achievements last year. The phase three studies of Tomanersen for Huntington's disease and Tofferson for SOD1 ALS achieved full enrollment. We initiated phase three studies with two of our rare wholly owned cardiometabolic disease programs, TTR-LRX for patients with TTR cardiomyopathy and APOC3-LRX for patients with FCS. And importantly, all six of our phase three studies continue to progress well. We also made substantial progress with our mid-stage programs, including reporting positive data from six studies, initiating more than 10 new phase two studies, and expanding the reach of our technology by demonstrating our ability to safely deliver antisense medicines by aerosol to the lung. We are well positioned for a very busy year of catalysts, uh, the first significant of which is the phase three data for the Valor study of Tofferson in patients with SOD1 ALS. ALS is a disease particularly of importance for us because antisense technology is ideally suited to address the root causes of ALS. We have leveraged our platform to develop medicines to treat all forms of this disease. Today, with four medicines in development, we believe we could truly have ALS around. Toperson has the potential to become the first disease-modifying treatment for ALS, which we believe will fundamentally change the ALS treatment landscape. Positive Toperson data would also give us greater confidence for our programs for the treatment of other forms of ALS. We believe Toperson may also have the potential to slow progression or even delay the onset of disease in pre-symptomatic SOD1 ALS patients, similar to the profound effects demonstrated by pre-symptomatic SMA patients treated with Spinraza before symptom onset. Biogen plans to initiate the ATLAS study this year to address this question and hopefully demonstrate a similarly profound benefit for Tofferson in pre-symptomatic ALS patients. <clears throat> Our next ALS program to enter development is ION363 for the treatment of FUS ALS, which we plan to move directly into a pivotal study, this study shortly. FUS ALS is a devastating, rapidly progressive form of ALS caused by mutations in the FUS gene. So we are pleased to be moving so rapidly to evaluate this medicine in patients with such a clear unmet medical need. And importantly, ION363 is Ionis' first wholly owned ALS medicine to enter the clinic. In addition to these exciting ALS catalysts, we have a busy agenda from programs across our wholly owned portfolio. Coming up in the first half of this year, we look forward to multiple catalysts, including key data uh, readouts and study initiations. We plan to report top-line phase two data from PKK-LRX and GHR-LRX for the treatments of HAE and acromegaly, respectively. We also plan to present more detailed data from our ENAC 2.5RX and AGT-LRX programs at upcoming scientific meetings taking place in May. 
At the American Thoracic Society meeting, we plan to present phase two data for ENAC 2.5 RX in patients with cystic fibrosis. And at the American College of Cardiology conference, we plan to present phase two data for AGT-LRX in patients with resistant hypertension. Each of these medicines has the potential to change the standard of care for these indications. Additionally, these medicines have the potential to address additional indications, representing further opportunities for growth. Looking at upcoming study initiations, we are very close to starting a phase two study for ION-373 in patients with Alexander disease. Together with ION-363 for patients with FUS ALS, these programs represent significant advancement among our wholly owned neurological disease medicines. We plan to advance AGT-LRX into a larger phase 2B study in resistant hypertension patients on three or more antihypertensive medications, a population representative of real-world patients. This study is expected to get underway soon. We also plan to study AGT-LRX in patients with heart failure in a phase 2 study expected to start mid-year. And also in the first half, we look forward to advancing ION-224, our wholly owned medicine targeting BGAT2, and our most advanced medicine in development for NASH into a phase 2B study. <clears throat> Looking to the second half of this year, we expect even more key value driving events. We plan to further expand our pulmonary disease franchise based on a growing body of data supporting aerosol delivery and antisense medicines to the lung, in addition to continuing to advance our phase two study in patients with COPD, we look forward to advancing our cystic fibrosis development program with the initiation of a larger phase 2B study of ENAC 2.5 RX in cystic fibrosis patients not amenable to CFTR modulators. Biogen recently offered an early preview of our Alzheimer's disease program, noting that MAP-T-RX demonstrated durable time and dose-dependent reductions in CSF tau protein and was generally well-tolerated in the phase 1-2 study in Alzheimer's disease patients. With Biogen, we look forward to reporting these results later this year. And as I mentioned, we of course look forward to data from phase three Valor study of Tofersen in patients with side one ALS later in the second half. In addition, in the first half of this year, we plan to host a series of disease focused educational webinars with invited experts who will discuss current treatment options and needs for patients with cystic fibrosis, hereditary angioedema and acromegaly. We look forward to hosting these webinars prior to top line data reports for each of these programs. Around the middle of the year, we plan to wrap up this series with an investor focused webcast to talk specifically about data from these programs in the context of the unmet market need. Importantly, with our pipeline progress to date and our key anticipated data catalysts this year, we are well positioned for a steady cadence of phase three data for years to come. These data support our goal of 12 or more medicines on the market in 2026, including potentially six or more wholly owned medicines. And with that, I'll turn the call back over to Brett to close this portion of the call. Thanks, Richard. This is an exciting time for Ionis as we expect to accelerate our next stage of growth in liver a growing number of new transformational medicines to patients in need. We have the potential to bring three new medicines to market by 2023. And looking further ahead, we're well on our way to achieving our goal of 12 or more medicines on the market in 2026, over half from our wholly owned pipeline. In support of our new vision to commercialize our wholly owned medicines, we're making significant investments to aggressively advance these programs forward. And also as part of our strategy, as the wholly owned pipeline develops, we're setting our plans to determine the best path forward for each asset to maximize value to patients and to shareholders. And from across our entire pipeline, we look forward to a continuous flow of phase three data readouts for many years to come. <clears throat> in addition to investing in our wholly owned pipeline, we're investing in building our commercial capabilities and implementing our plans to commercialize our own medicines, advancing our technology and potentially expanding it 
with new technologies that complement our AntiSense platform. We believe these investments will provide substantial returns, including double-digit revenue growth. And this growth will be driven as successful phase three programs enter the market, generating more value from the wholly owned programs we commercialize and from those programs partnered today and those we retain longer before we partner in the future. Before we close this portion of the call, I wanna take a moment to recognize Rare Disease Day, which is being celebrated around the world this week. For many years, IONIS has dedicated and continues to dedicate substantial resources to serve patients suffering from rare diseases such as SMA and ALS. We're proud to say that in the case of SMA, we at IONIS pioneered a new market and brought the first disease-modifying medicine to these patients, many of whom are with us today because of Spinraza. And in the case of ALS, in just a few short months, we again have the potential to deliver the first disease-modifying medicine to treat ALS. We're proud of these achievements, but, but we're only at the beginning. Of course, Rare Disease Day is about the patients and families living with rare diseases. For our strong partnerships with these brave people, we're confident that we will continue to provide transformational medicines for more patients for many years to come. With that in mind, please join me in recognizing and celebrating the dedication and accomplishments of the brave patients suffering from devastating rare diseases, as well as the families who care for them. And with that, I'll open the call for questions. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask your question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your question, please press star and then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. And the first question comes from Yaren Werber with Cowan. Please go ahead. Great. Uh, thanks so much for taking my progress and, and really nice uh, progress. Um, two questions. Beth, maybe just for your housekeeping and then uh, a question more about the pipeline. Just on, in terms of top line, your guidance for more than 600 in revenues, give, can you give us a little bit of a sense? How are you looking at Spinraza? Are you kind of expo expecting it to be kind of flattish in a growing segment, or are you expecting a little growth? And I know collaborative revenues you mentioned are going to ramp more in the second half, but anything you can guide us there. And then a quick question on the Enix 2.5 uh, technology. I mean, it sounds like we're going to get data – uh, shortly, the study is, is fully dosed to phase 2A, and you're noting that you'll start a phase 2B now, which is new in CF this year. Can you just remind us, um, are we mostly going to be looking at expression in, in the CF patients, or are we going to be able to also look at some kind of a, a pulmonary function like FEV1, or is the study just too small, the phase 2A? Thank you. Sure, Yaren. Good morning. Um, so thinking about our top-line guidance for, for this year, um, mm -hmm. when you think about the commercial revenue stream, you know, really the, the only um, impact to commercial revenue is, um, is the, the transition for Texedi and WeLibra from, um, uh, from a, a product sales um, top-line in Europe to royalty revenue in Europe. Um, you know, we continue to think that Spinraza has a very bright future, as I mentioned. Um, we see the, you know, the opportunity to continue to expand the numbers of patients on treatment, um, primarily outside of the United States. Um, but I think the strong efficacy of Spinraza that's been, you know, well established in more than 11,000 patients for, you know, seven plus years um, uh, for many of those patients you know, really bodes well for Spinraza's future. And so, um, you know, we're not anticipating, um, a, a, you know, a negative impact at all on the top line with regard to Spinraza. And then on R&D revenues, um, you know, as we always do, we probabilize the many, many um, milestone opportunities we have over the course of the year. Um, and by doing that, you know, we know that um, we have lots of opportunity to overachieve on our top line um, as the year progresses and we achieve those milestone events um, and the payments that go with them. So, you know, starting here in February, um, you know, we like to um, make sure that we have guidance that we can achieve 
Um, but consistently in the past, we have um, outperformed that guidance, and uh, um, and we certainly have those opportunities this year as well. Thanks, Beth. And uh, to address your, I'm sorry, was there a follow-up? I, I was just going to ask Beth, just remind us if you don't mind the, with Sobe the uh, the royalty and milestone uh, agreement and what you've disclosed, so we'll make sure everybody gets this correct in the models. Thank you. Yep, sure. We haven't disclosed the actual royalty percentage, um, but think about it um, in the in the general range of um, royalties associated with a, a drug that we share in um, many of the um, post marketing um, activities. So we're continue to um, to supply drug and handle the distribution. We continue to um, you know to manage um, safety. We continue to be actively involved with KOLs and with setting the global strategy um, and and working um, very closely with Sobe. So think about it um, really as a as a relationship in which we share in the um, the opportunity for top line growth. And then um, to address your question, Jaron, on ENAC, so as a reminder, last year we um, demonstrated um, and presented data on uh, demonstrating robust reductions of ENAC levels in the lung of normal volunteers following aerosol weekly delivery with excellent safety and tolerability. This year at the ATS meeting in May, we plan to present uh, our first data in patients with cystic fibrosis um, and um, in our phase two study, which is complete now, and we'll, and we'll share the results from that study. Um, in that study, indeed, and um, because this is our first experience in patients, safety and tolerability will be very important to demonstrate, and we're looking forward to sharing those results. In addition, as you said, it's a small study. It's also a short study. I think it's three months um, or so in duration. Um, but we will, be, we will be presenting data on um, lung function, um, and we're very much looking forward to sharing, uh, to presenting that data um, at ATS this year. So stay tuned for that. Um, and then in addition, just as a reminder, ENAC is the first of several drugs moving into development uh, for pulmonary diseases with, delivered by aerosol. We have, we're starting, planning to start another clinical trial this year um, to coincide with the ENAC studies. And also the ENAC, we also have a phase two study for ENAC and COPD that's ongoing. Um, and then more coming behind uh, the new clinical start this year. So um, we're very much looking forward to building this franchise out for pulmonary diseases. The next question. Aaron? The next. Okay. The next question comes from Paul Matthijs with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Hey, this is Alex on Paul. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, I was just curious about. Uh, this new HEFREF program for uh, the AGT product and, and what the rationale is for that mechanism of action and whether um, development there is pending anything in hypertension or if you plan to go in that direction regardless of how the hypertension program goes. Thanks. Richard, would you like to take that? Sure. Uh, happy to. So, uh, as you know, RAS inhibitors have been used in heart failure. And uh, our preclinical work certainly points to a robust effect uh, by targeting angiotensinogen in heart failure models. Um, in addition to that, uh, the, the idea here um, is, is certainly not a new one, but the, the design of the study in HEFREP patients allows us in a population where a lot is known um, about heart failure and the effects of RAS inhibitors, uh, as well as safety in that regard, will allow us uh, to do a, a strong proof of concept study. It's powered to get us uh, a bit more information, not only on biomarkers, but also on functional output. So we're excited about getting um, you know, our first look in heart failure in uh, humans with, with reduced uh, uh, with, with the reduced effect. Yeah. And, and uh, as a reminder, Alex, again, we're, we're planning to present uh, much more detailed data, full data set, um, people from our phase two study 
in patients with refractory hypertension, uh, ACC, you may. Great, thank you. You're welcome. The next que question comes from Jim Bertineau with Will Wells Fargo. Please go, please go ahead. Hey, guys, congrats on all the progress. Uh, terrific stuff. Um, maybe on the financials and then a pipeline question. On the financials, just, um, Beth, does the Spinraza royalty outlook contemplate some COVID recovery and less spacing out of intrathecal injections? Just interested in how you're thinking about that. And then remind us if you're at the point with PTC uh, where you've reached uh, the sales threshold where you're participating in, in some of the upside from um, Latin America for uh, peg fatty and whey liver? Sure. Hi, Jim. Um, so, so with Spinraza, um, you know, I think we in Biogen certainly anticipate that um, the COVID environment is going to ease um, over the course of this year. Um, and as Biogen noted in their um, year-end earnings call a few weeks ago, um, they're already seeing patients um, move back to Spinraza from um, a competitive product primarily because, you know, they're, they're seeing, um, you know, the need for the efficacy that Spinraza affords. Um, and so the fact that that's already started in the fourth quarter and we anticipate that to continue um, throughout this year and to, um, you know, and to be um, aided by the fact that the, uh, the pandemic is starting to ease, um, certainly in the U.S. And, and around the world as well. Um, for PTC, um, we were, you know, we hit um, that point where we started the, the clock um, on, uh, on the 12 months. And so we would anticipate um, that we may be able to um, see some, some contribution from PTC sales in Latin America this year, but it will be late this year. Great, that's helpful. And then, then maybe um, on the pipeline and, and for Richard, just on FUS1 ALS, could you speak about you know, the strength of supportive data, whether it's just, you know, the biologic rationale or any preclinical data, and how that compares to the strength of support for SOD1 ALS, just trying to get a sense of how validating, you know, one may be for, for the other. And then the uh, second part is just on um, your uh, chart of catalysts or milestones, uh, Huntington's update um, in terms of natural history study and open label extension is listed sometime in 2021. And so just maybe to give, give us a sense of what you would expect to see in contrasting those two groups. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a high level and then I'll pass it over to my colleague, Eric, to, to flesh it out a little bit. Plus ALS, of course, is a monogenic uh, form and hereditary form of, of ALS. And because there is a known causative uh, genetic component here, that we can directly, uh, we can directly um, target. We we believe that the FUS ALS compound, which uh, we've shown, is a very good drug for lowering uh, FUS the FUS genetic component, um, bodes well for us and allows us, in fact, with our conversations with regulatory, to move directly into uh, a, a study that is registrational. And I'll pass it over uh, over to Eric for any other comments. All right, yeah. Uh, thanks, Richard. I, 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 it's mostly right. I mean, FUS is a uh, known genetic cause of ALS, much like uh, SOD1 drives SOD1 ALS. It's known to be a path pathogenic protein which accumulates and aggregates in cells. And so it's similar to Toberson in that we're reducing a, a genetic cause and reducing a pathogenic protein. And we do have preclinical data that, that supports that reducing FUS can, can provide a benefit. So I do think it's similar to the TOPRS program in, in that regard. Um, and then I think you asked about Huntington and uh, what uh, Roche is planning to present. And I, I can just really refer you to their statements where they are continuing to plan to present some data from the open label study and the natural history study at some, uh, some point in 2021. Um, and then beyond that, we're really uh, focused on the phase three study, which is progressing and, and scheduled for its readout in 2022, which I think is the key definitive experiment for Huntington disease. Great, thanks for taking the questions, guys. Thanks, Jim. 
The next question comes from Tyler Van Buren with Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Hey guys, good morning. Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, you know, on the financial side, you guys have uh, been profitable over the last few years. Uh, so I guess based on the guidance, this would be the first year you guys would be, you know, turning a net loss, and obviously that's justified uh, by having, you know, pushing the wholly owned programs moving forward. But should we expect kind of a modest net loss? like this for the foreseeable future in the next several years uh, or should you know will it continue to grow and then uh, the second question on the pipeline is just related to the, the phase two programs we have a decent amount of clarity on the phase three programs when we'll get those readouts when they could reach the market but i guess as we look across you know the two or the four phase two readouts over the course of the first half um, which one of those do you think could make it to market first or which one or two um, and, and when might that be? So uh, thanks for the questions, Tyler, and good morning. Um, we, uh, we have, um, you know, it, it's, we're in an enviable position with a very strong balance sheet um, at IONIS to invest in um, all aspects of the pipeline and um, our commercial strategy and our technology um, to, to really maximize the value um, of, of, for IONIS, to grow IONIS um, for the benefit of patients, shareholders, and the like. And that's exactly what we're doing um, now, as you know. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to do that um, to, uh, to maximize, um, you know, our upside in all possible ways. We're not really projecting right now what next year or the year after um, will look like, um, but we will continue to invest um, over the next few years. Of course, we also have um, the benefit of um, multiple sources of revenue, as Beth will uh, said in her in her presentation, as well as she reminds us of all the time through R and D revenue partnerships, as well as our commercial revenue, and we expect our next, next commercial product to be Topherson. Um, and uh, TTR like polyneuropathy and um, uh, Huntington, uh, potentially those three medicines reaching market in 2023. So you can see how the commercial revenue as well as the R&D revenue will really offset our, those investments in the future. Too early to project um, profitability for 2022, um, but certainly we're going to be continuing to invest. Beth, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think that was I think that was extremely well said, Brett. Um, maybe the only thing I will add is that, you know, we have a long history of financial discipline, and we will continue to exercise that mm -hmm. discipline while um, investing, you know, deeply in our wholly owned pipeline and our technology, and 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 really um, ensuring that our medicines. Um, are prepared and ready to successfully launch um, when they get to market. And as far as your, um, Tyler, your question on uh, phase two readouts, which, you know, we have a lot coming. Um, in the first half of this year, we have three wholly owned rare disease programs, hereditary angioedema, um, uh, acromegaly, as well as the ENAC cystic fibrosis program. Um, I, I think, you know, based on, what we see as the next step for those programs and the size of the next studies that would require them, uh, that would uh, allow them to be registered and approved. I would have to say that the acromegaly program with you, Richard, is the furthest along that um, pending positive data from the uh, study that's going to read out this year, uh, this first half of this year, um, is probably positioned well for to move to a pivotal study. Would you say, Richard? Sure. I, I would say that the um, after the phase 2B for cystic fibrosis, there would be positioning for phase 3, but there's work to be done there. And then for PKKL, you're also in a position of, depending on the results of this phase 2 study, but if, if positive, that too could move relatively quickly. Right. Thanks for taking the questions. Thank you, Tyler. The next question comes from Vincent Chen with Bernstein. Please go ahead. Uh, congrats on all progress, and thank you very much for taking the question. Maybe just one quick question. I was wondering, uh, now that you've had a little more experience dosing RNA into the CNS, how, how do you think about likely dosing regimens for this? I, I noticed, for example, that the 
the FOS ALS program is dosed, I guess, after the initial loading dose every every two months, which is kind of the, the I guess, the midpoint of the doses you tried in Huntington's and somewhat less frequent dosing than uh, than the SOD1 program. How, how, how do you think about the, the dosing required to treat uh, CNS diseases? Eric, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Vincent. Um, I mean, we, we're always looking at extending our, our, our dosing regimen and making them consistent with the duration of action of, of the drug. Uh, and so in our earlier programs, we were working out how to dose the CNS and learning how, how to get the drugs delivered in a way that they could reduce their targets, understanding those relationships. And as we learn more and more, we can under, we're understanding how to extend the dosing regimen. So I would look for continued expansion and extension of our dosing regimens in the clinic. It's a key objective, and we think the profile of the drug supports it. And we're working across all of our clinical programs to try and understand how we can best extend dosing, because obviously extended dosing is, is much more convenient for patients. And an example of that would be in the Huntington program, where we work with Roche to get the every four-month dosing into the phase three program um, that's ongoing and scheduled to read out uh, in 2022. So we think that's a, a good benefit, and we can transfer that and hopefully extend it across more programs. And if I could just add think? to that, uh, if I could just add to that really quickly, then, um, you know, our, our strategy to enhance um, – uh, durability and reduced dosing frequency is coming in two forms, right? Um, we're, we're learning how to select molecules um, uh, more optimally. That allows us to have a longer duration of effect and also through medicinal chemistry, um, new chemistries that are coming down, down the pipe. Um, and then the last thing I would mention is, um, as we in Biogen have said, we have demonstrated uh, very durable reductions in tau. In our, in our study with MAP-T in um, patients with mild Alzheimer's disease. And that data will be presented this year, and I think it's going to be very telling um, how durable that is, uh, the effects we're seeing with that molecule. Have, have you gained any insight into, I guess, using the Huntington's data, where you do now have some patients who have been treated on every four-month dosing in, I guess, the, the open-label extension of the initial generation HD1 patients, have you gained incremental sort of PKPD insights into into sort of what, what, I guess, feasibility of longer dosing? And is there any reason why FUS is dosed more frequently uh, than, than, I guess, what you're doing in Huntington's? Is it a matter, of, like, for example, are you trying, is it a matter of knocking down further? Just kind of curious what the thinking is there. Well, for some of the diseases like ALS, they're very aggressive diseases. And so you want to get enough drug on board quickly to make a difference and reduce the protein quickly because the patients are progressing fairly rapidly. And so that's been some of the thinking in ALS. Huntington is a much slower progressing disease, and so you can take some time to get the drug to steady state and get the and dial in the level of target uh, reduction that we want. Um, and I, I really think that some of it is, is, a, is a matter of, as you say, understanding the PKPD of the drug, and it, it takes time and some good human clinical experimentation to get that and really understand how our drugs are working in the CNS of, of, of humans as, as opposed to preclinical species. And so in addition to what Brett said in terms of optimizing the chemistries and understanding how to design the drugs, there's also just optimizing our dosing regimen and understanding how our existing drug, drugs work. And, and that's what we did along with Roche in, in, in some of the hunting experiments that led us to, to that extended interval. Great. Thank you very much for the, uh, the, for the discussion. And congrats again on the Thanks. program. Thanks. Thank you. The next question comes from Joel Beatty with City. Please go ahead. Hi, congrats on the progress. Could you tell us more about the phase two trial that's ongoing for ENAC and COPD? And um, I mean, the first part of that question is when could we see data from that trial? And then the, the second part is how predictive is your cystic fibrosis clinical data in predicting efficacy for COPD? Richard, thanks for that. Yeah, so with our phase one, phase two A experience uh, with the ENAC molecule, we were able to look at a broad spectrum of genetic modifications. And that led, led us to move into COPD because in addition to um, the ENAC uh, target gene going down, we saw other important genes 
I don't think we've disclosed at this point, but there will be more information coming out. Uh, in regard to what else we saw in that, uh, that early work that led us to move fairly rapidly into a COPD trial. COPD trial, uh, likely reporting out, I, I don't know what we've, we've put out publicly, probably early next year, as well as the, um, the phase 2B also would be uh, next year, 2022. And, and Joel, that's a study in COPD patients, nearly 200 patients uh, for a little over three months or so of treatment, which the primary change will be FEV1. So we'll be looking at real clinical um, out function outcomes in that in that COPD study. Yeah, and, and, and just to add that if you think about ENAC inhibition as a way to rehydrate the lung, and so there's a strong rationale for using it in COPD just like in cystic fibrosis, because you can restore the hydration balance by inhibiting e Great. Thank you for all that. Thank you, Joel. The next question, question comes from Yale Jen with Laidlaw and Company. Please go ahead. Uh, good, good morning, and thanks for taking questions. As well, congrats on the progress. Uh, my first question is that uh, in terms of RD uh, revenue sort of anticipation for the 2021, are you guys not including any possible partnership, and that's why you have the current projection, or that's part of things already sort of included? Yale, sorry, could you repeat your question? I didn't quite hear you. For the R&D uh, revenue of 2021, uh, are you guys not including any uh, revenues from potential new partners, or just, uh, and that's what the current estimate to be? Great question. So, so I, I want to reiterate that, um, that our top line guidance really reflects the new strategy to, um, to, you know, hold on to our drugs longer, um, partner if we do partner, you know, later in development, and to, um, you know, to really advance a, a broad pipeline of home owned medicines to the market, um, primarily in neuro and cardio. Um, so really, our, as we think about our R&D revenue, um, it's based off of, you know, amortization from, you know, prior upfronts and milestones. Um, as well as, you know, a, a whole host of potential milestones um, and licensing fees across our current partnered programs in, um, uh, in drugs and, uh, and later stage research programs. Okay, that's very helpful. Maybe just one question for Brett, which is that you mentioned that, that you also contemplate potential new technology to complement the current uh, te uh, technology you have. What likely to be an idea technology that may be fitting into the bill? So, um, thanks, Yale. Uh, think about the technology investments that we're making in two ways, or in two, two buckets, if you will. The first are technologies or investments in technology that expand the reach of our current technology, antisense. So, new chemistries, new like chemistries that open up new tissues like muscle, cardiac tissue, um, immune cells, cancer cells. We're, we're working on that with um, both uh, with partners uh, as well as uh, heavy investments internally. Uh, new routes of delivery is another example of that to expand the scope of our technology like we do with pulmonary and before that intrathecal and we're doing more. Um, uh, genomics is a third, uh, where, you know, everybody knows genomically linked targets are the best targets from a validation standpoint prior to you validating a target with a, with a drug. Um, and we're investing in that. We have lots of hits. We have a lot of genomic um, uh, targets that we're very excited about that are very novel. Um, and these are through partnerships, as well as work we're doing with our functional genomics group internally. That bucket one. Bucket two is what I think you were really asking about, which is new platforms, new complementary technologies outside of Antisense. And I really can't provide 
uh, much detail there, except that we are investing in um, uh, reviewing and, and con conducting proof of concept studies and doing work in various areas to do things, to, to invest in technologies that can do things maybe more, more effectively, more efficiently, that AntiSense um, is, is, has less success in doing. Um, so technologies, for example, that can more effectively upregulate the expression of genes. Of course, we can do that with our technology. Spinraza is the perfect example of that, but um, it's, it's less robust to be able to do that. And technologies that do that will help us complement um, the things we can do to expand our reach for anti-sense. And, and that's a little further out, but we're working on it. And we're working on it in, uh, very um, seriously. So stay tuned. Okay, great. And thanks a lot. Again, congrats. Thanks, you. The next question comes from Luca Isi with RBC. Please go ahead. Oh, terrific. Uh, thanks so much for taking my questions. Congrats on all the progress. I have two, one on HAE and one on AGT. So on HAE, I think there was some interesting back and forth on the editorial of the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of weeks ago, um, where essentially the debate was around inhibiting liver PKK versus inhibiting plasma calicrine, which is what the Xyra is doing, and whether maybe uh, knocking down liver PKK is less preferable than what the Xyra is doing. So wondering if you have any thoughts on that, and maybe bigger picture, if you can offer any color on how should we think about the upcoming phase two data. And then on AGT, I know you have two molecules in development at this point. Wondering if you can comment on how you're thinking about the relative prioritizations of one versus the other, given that, again, one is already in phase two versus the, the other just entered phase one in healthy volunteers. So um, any call there will be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. Maybe I'll take a stab at the HAE question, which you can fill in and then take the AGT question, the two molecules. So, um, you know, by far the, the, the vast majority of calicrine is derived from the hepatocyte, the liver, um, whether it's in the plasma or what's, you know, elsewhere or what's in tissues. Um, uh, we are blocking pre-calocrine um, with our mechanism of action that, that essentially prevents the production of pre-calocrine into the plasma, as well as the, um, um, the metabolite of pre-calocrine and calocrine, the active molecule that leads to bradykinin uh, production and hereditary angioedema attack. So we're doing, uh, we're actually, we feel that our mechanism, our approach um, is superior to an approach targeting calicrine because we, we prevent the molecule from ever being made. We don't have to mop it up um, after it's been made. Um, and uh, we think that this is the, um, potentially a, a, superior, a superior approach to prophylactic treatment of hereditary angioedema. And we're, you know, we're really looking forward. Uh, the New England Journal data you referred to is very encouraging, and we look forward to presenting um, that phase two data this first half of, of this year. Um, Richard, if you want to add to that, please do, or jump into AGT. No, I think you covered that nicely. Um, so I'll, I'll jump into AGT for just a minute. We have two molecules, one that is uh, phase two be ready, and one that is uh, not yet in the clinic, uh, or is just started in the clinic, I should say. Our phase one uh, study for ION-904 has started. And so we're, we're moving forward with the 2.5 LICA. Now, the thing to remember is that the 2.5 LICA is a, based on all of our preclinical data, a significantly uh, higher potency molecule. So we think, we think of it in, in two ways. First, in heart failure, it would be highly um, perhaps um, beneficial to have a molecule that we can administer uh, very infrequently with a sub-Q approach. And in, in addition to that, the 2.5 LICA gives us a, a potential for oral. So it's really a, a play on uh, really moving into a best, uh, first and best in class. Uh, for that indication. And so we're moving that one forward quickly and we'll have data along the way uh, in the phase one trial to be able to read out exactly what that potency looks like in, in man. 
potency and duration of action. So look for that. Thank you. The next question comes from Jessica Fai with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Good morning. Um, this is Daniel for Jessica Fai. Thanks for taking our question. Um, focusing on near-term readout in acromegaly, um, given that growth hormone receptors are found in multiple tissues throughout the body, do you see a risk in targeting a liver-specific growth hormone receptor expression alone uh, with your Leica product? Um, and then when it reads out, what should we expect with the top line data? So um, I can take that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so first of all, yes, uh, we are targeting uh, liver, where the majority of uh, the receptor, uh, at least systemically, uh, uh, lies. And, and so the initial is in, in addition to somatostatin analogs, which have already, um, you know, gathered up um, uh, inhibition of uh, majority of the receptors. And now what we're doing is significantly reducing uh, the activity in the liver. Again, I, I think, you know, wait for the data, but the, the top line data is going to be IGF-1. And we'll be looking at also a... Um, probably not top line, but later we'll be able to report out all of the information on quality of life where we're seeing some uh, uh, exciting kind of uh, results. So I think that's the, uh, what you're going to be able to, to see as we move forward and why we think uh, liver, uh, liver targeting is, is likely to be uh, not only additive, but potentially even as a single agent. We've started our single agent study. Now. Yeah, and I just add to that, liver is also the primary source of IGF-1, in addition to the growth hormone receptors um, in the hepatocytes, which of course drives this disease. And, um, you know, what we're hoping to show is that patients who are poorly controlled on somatostatin analogs, um, that we can get um, a fair number of those patients, a good, good number of those patients under control to normal IGF-1 levels. And that's what we're hoping to do. And we think this mechanism um, has the, you know, has, has the potential to do that. So we're looking forward to sharing those results. Thank you. The next question comes from Mani Faruhar with SVP Leering. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for the question, guys. Um, we'll start with a specific one and then go to a more general one. Um, there's been a little discussion about the HAE opportunity on this call. Um, can you dig in more detail on where you see the opportunities that commercially and clinically in terms of frequency of administration, um, depth of attack reduction, like just where you see that opportunity and how that would translate into a clinical trial design that can generate a label that could support, uh, that could support a success in a pretty competitive market? And then as a second question more broadly, um, there's a lot of discussion around oligotherapeutics outside of the liver expanding into other um, other areas of therapy, um, mostly by your comp competing companies who seem to be unaware of Spinraza and your success in CNS. Mm -hmm. um, as you think about producing data of effective knockdown and therapy in, in lung and other indications, how should we think about other target tissues? How should we think about the tempo with which that could translate into an acceleration on the R&D partnership side as you sort of expand out the aperture of potential target tissues that you could find in which you could find partnerships? So thanks, Bonnie. Um, great, great questions. Um, so I'd like to, Oneza, um, who's on, on the call, um, who hasn't had a chance to speak up, um, to talk about the opportunity that we see in HAE. Like, as you say, it's a you know, there's 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 a, there's a drugs out there already that are uh, treating this disease, but we think um, we, we we like the potential of our of our current model. But I'd like um, Oneza to maybe speak to this. Sure, and be happy to. 
Um, hi, Mani. Um, so as I think has already been said, but I think it's worth uh, reiterating, is that we're really looking at a treatment that's designed to prevent attacks rather than simply kind of treat acute episodes on demand, right? Um, and we expect an improved tolerability profile than existing therapies as well. I think the name of the game over here in this marketplace has really been about um, zero attacks. And uh, as you said, um, Tech Zero's, um, you know, done a nice job uh, as they've entered the market with that. Um, what we see as a continued opportunity from an efficacy perspective is the durability of response. Uh, we know that initially you can get down to zero attacks, but can you actually maintain the zero attacks over time? And we really believe that the PKK, um, you know, again, the, the mechanism and what's already been described on the call um, will uh, will help us achieve that, and of course we'll see that as the phase two data comes out. But that is really where the uh, positioning competitively of the product will be. Um, and then, of course, um, you know we know that um, the current treatments on the marketplace have um, you know a, a more viscous, difficult to inject profile as well, and we'll certainly um, you know beat that profile as well. So that's where we're looking at it. And uh, so, so we're excited. We think the eight, our PKK Lyco molecule has the potential to be the best in the class. We have to prove it, of course, um, uh, with respect to reduction in attack rates. But we shall see. We're certainly getting great reductions in PKK, which is the cause of this disease. I mean, bradykinin is, but PKK is the promoter of bradykinin levels. Um, regarding other target tissues, Monty, uh, uh, there were a lot of questions. Um, um, in your question. Uh, so let me take a stab at it. And uh, if I don't get it right, uh, just follow up. But yeah, see our CNS platform, um, we've just begun to scratch the surface of new molecules, new drugs for devastating neurodegenerative diseases that are coming um, into our pipeline. Our pipeline is already very rich and it's going to get richer with more and more neuro drugs as we continue to validate the platform showing again and again, robust reductions in target in CSF as we're doing again this year with, with the Tau program, as we've done in the past with Huntington and Sod one and Spiraza. Um, and more is coming. And as Eric referred to earlier, we're continuing to optimize delivery to the CNS with less frequent dosing. And we continue to move forward with new molecules to do that. Um, lung is a potential new franchise. Uh, we're very excited about this. You know, a, a years ago we had a lung program and we showed we had evidence of activity, but it wasn't good enough. And we went back to the lab and developed new chemistries, uh, Gen 2.5, which seems to be getting it done. Um, we're getting great target engagement, excellent um, safety and tolerability, and that's a new franchise that we're very excited about opening up new organs and tissues. And then with respect to, um, you know, outside of new routes of delivery, we're continuing to look at routes of delivery all the time. Um, but outside of that are, you know, new chemistries to open up new organ systems and tissues. And, you know, we believe that we will be in the in development um, this year for a muscle like a program. That's our plan. That's our goal. And um, we can't provide more details on that at this time, but that's just one of several that we think are going to be coming for targeting muscle. Um, and um, not just skeletal muscle, but also heart failure, cardiac tissue. Uh, and we're very, we're very encouraged by what we're, what the, the work we've done so far, the data we've generated, and more, more are coming too. And um, you know, we've also talked about our pancreatic beta cell uh, program. We've done work with AstraZeneca. We're doing our work ourselves. And we have other life that's coming um, for new cell types and tissues that we're very encouraged by the data we've generated so far. And with respect to partnerships, I'm not sure if you meant. Um, uh, bringing, you know, partnering out licensing or in licensing, but I'll assume you mean in licensing. We've already established partnerships in um, with companies and investing our um, our capital to broaden our scope in Leica Chemistries, um, and we're planning, um, hoping to do more of that, um, so that uh, we're going to take advantage of partnerships um, to expand our Leica platform and to complement um, all the great work we're doing here at Ionis under our roof in our medicinal chemistry um, program. I hope that answered your question. Uh, yeah, that's helpful. One of the, um, I think what I was thinking about is if you look at consensus estimates looking out forward, they don't contemplate 
acceleration in your R and D revenue uh, from expansion into a broader into a broader universe of out licensing opportunities for you. Um, I always think about should we think about uh, other opportunities? Should you prove out delivery in lung, delivery in muscle, uh, serially other in other tissue types? Should we thinking should we think about this changing the top line sort of Kager as it were? of growth of R&D? Should we think of this as more of a step function as one of your smaller RNAi competitors who discussed it? Uh, just how do you think about the size and the speed with which you guys could capitalize on potential expansion R&D revenue if you're, if you're attacking different tissue types? I guess that was more of my question. Sure. Well, expanding the scope of the platform certainly will drive even more interest by um, you know other companies wanting to partner with us to take advantage of all the great progress we're making. I mean, we we there's tr so much interest already in what we're doing today, and then there's also tremendous interest um, in uh, working with us to develop these technologies. You know, we're working with AstraZeneca on new chemistries and new routes of delivery. We're working with Biogen on new chemistries um, uh, to maximize delivery to muscle as well as CNS. Um, and there will certainly be interest as we expand this scope by other companies um, that will want to take advantage of this in the future. And sure, we'll, we'll be doing more partnerships in the future. Uh, but as we emphasized in the, in the earlier in the call today, um, you know, we're going to be very selective um, in, the, in the partnerships we do. They not just for the R&D revenue that you referred to, of all that's nice. Um, it's really to bring strategic value to the company. Um, the, you know, to really expand the scope of our technology and, and um, to really, you know, strengthen our leadership position in this space. So, you know, I do think that um, partnerships based on advancements we're making in, tech, in the technology that you referred to are um, likely in the future. I also think that partnerships for some of the broader indications that we're working on are possible too. Um, even without those, you know, within the, within the existing pipeline. So lots of potential for partnerships down the road, lots of interest, and we will be selective and will not just do partnerships for the sake of um, financial return, but also for um, strategic value. Great. That's really helpful. Thanks. Thank you. The next question comes from Jason Gerberry with Bank of America. Please go ahead. Oh, hi. This is Chiang for Jason. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, I guess the first one on Huntington. Uh, can you outline some of the things you'll be looking at with your uh, natural history cohort and open label data that are going to be presenting sometime this year? What can get you comfortable in ability to show improvement on functional endpoints in phase three ultimately? Uh, curious how important it is to see your matching natural history cohort is deteriorating over a 15 month observation period. Uh, I guess the second question on HAE, just to confirm, uh, to generate competitive data and to compete in the space, is the thought that you will need to generate longer term follow up data beyond a typical six month trial? to prove um, better maintenance of attack reduction benefit. Thank you. Um, Eric, uh, would you like to talk about the Huntington uh, OLE? And I'll take the uh, HA. Yeah, so we, we touched on this a little bit earlier on the call. And um, again, Roche has stated that sometime this year, they're gonna discuss some data from the OLE and, and natural history studies. Um, and you'll see what, what, what they present and, and Beyond that, I really can't comment, um, but I, I do think that the key endpoint and the key thing to focus on is the ongoing phase three that's scheduled to read out in, in 2022. Um, Huntington's a, a slowly progressing disease, and this study is powered to, to give it the give the drug the time to lower mutant Huntington, which we know it does, and, and have a disease benefit and really test the hypothesis that lowering mutant Huntington will, will make a disease benefit. So that, to me, is the key experiment. And regarding the HAE question, um, the phase two study, as we've said, uh, we'll read out um, and we'll present top line data at least uh, the first half of, of this year in patients with um, uh, hereditary angioedema. We'll be looking at uh, um, frequency of attack rates um, uh, 
in over about a three month period of time. There's a wealth of data uh, published um, with existing therapies um, uh, on attack rates um, uh, that we will, you know, we'll compare to. We'll, we'll look at it and we'll ask ourselves, we'll answer, you know, ask ourselves whether or not we're competing, we're competitive, or potentially even superior. In, in attacking and in reducing attack rates. Um, and based on the data, we have to review the data, we'll decide on the next steps. We're out, we obviously have already had various options in place based on the data outcome, um, but I would not rule out this program, as Richard referred, mentioned earlier, uh, can move to a pivotal study based on the phase two data that comes out the first half of this year. We have to, we have to look at the data and then we have to decide what the best phase three uh, strategy would be. Yeah, yeah. One other <clears throat> piece of information to add to that, um, Brad, mm -hmm. is, is that we have moved all eligible patients into an open label extension that allows us to continue to monitor uh, attack rates uh, on the long term. So we have an open label extension for the phase two program that is ongoing, has already started. Many of these patients have been in the uh, open label extension for many months. And so um, that, that is where we're going to get uh, long-term data uh, very quickly. Yeah, and I will just add to the, the need, I think you said, beyond six months. So if you take a look at the real-world data and how patients are doing currently, you start seeing excursions um, from their therapies as early as three months. Uh, and then, you know, more substantial declines between that three to six month period. So um, we don't think that, you know, we would need um, data well beyond um, that period to demonstrate it. Thanks. Thanks, so The next question comes from Salvine Richter with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you so much for taking our, uh, our question. This is Sonia on for Salvine. A few quick questions from us. Um, I was wondering, could you um, give us the status on your prion disease asset and when you can expect data there? I think there was going to be a trial initiation sometime mid-year. And then also on the muscle lyca, um, if you could give us some um, color on what indications you would potentially go into, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Eric, would you like to run with that? Um, so I'll start with muscle lyca. Uh, we're not really prepared to discuss exactly what indications we're going into at, at this at this time on the muscle program, but um, we're very very excited about what we're doing in, in terms of, of being able to target the muscle, and there's lots of opportunities there um, in, in ver across various uh, spaces of, of neuromuscular disease. Um, and, and as for the for the preem program, I can't provide too much color on timing, but um, we are have identified several candidate molecules and working as hard as we can to, to rapidly get the best candidate forward and move it to patients. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. This concludes our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the conference back over to Brett Monia for any closing remarks. Well, thank you everybody for joining us on uh, today's call. And thank you for all the questions uh, uh, in the Q&A session. Obviously here at IONIS, we're very excited um, about the future, the present and the future of the company. Um, and we'll look forward, well, very much looking forward to providing um, additional updates on the progress, the great progress we're making at IONIS um, throughout the remainder of the year. So thank you again for joining and have a great day. This concludes our conference. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.